snake. It's Chico. The sixth tape begins with Chico's distress call. Then, we hear it around 32 seconds in, it cuts to what sounds like Chico being brutally electrocuted. An MGS tradition, usually one reserved for the player character, the snake of the story. Kids are natural, don't you think? Skullface has now shifted from working Chico to Paws. It's the first time that we've heard Skullface and Paws one-on-one. -on -one. In Chico's fifth tape, we do hear the boy dragged away, but not any exchange occurs between Skullface and Paws. And now that we do hear such an exchange, we find Skullface adopting a similar tone or affectation of familiarity, which he used again and again on Chico. He says, kid's a natural, don't you think? This is a common enough saying in showbiz. The implication is that Skullface and Paws, unlike Chico, are professional actors, thespians, liars, in other words. Don't, don't do it. Kids are natural, don't you think? It's also a bit of psychological torture, how blasé Skullface sounds. Meanwhile, Paws is in so much pain, she can hardly talk. She says nothing, but Skullface patiently pauses before starting back up his mind games. Kids are natural, don't you think? What do you think Big Boss will do? He'll know it's a trap, but he'll come anyway. That's the kind of man he is. Don't. Thanks to your report, a nuclear inspection team's being sent to their base. The scientist was our way in. It all ends soon, exactly as I've planned. All thanks to you. You've got now it's Paws he does the thinking for, essentially echoing the same approach that he used on Chico when they were alone. Using Big Boss as a weaponized pair of words, Skullface uses Paws' very loyalty to MSF itself against both it and her. He'll know it's a trap, but he'll come anyway. That's the kind of man he is. There's some cages to the east of a big building. East an old grassy facility. That's where we are. Help me, Snake. It's a setup. We have no choice. Yeah. If Chico talks, he could blow the new cover up. We can't hold off until the inspection's over. When can we be ready? It'll take at least 16 hours to confirm the flight path and prep a bird. The intel unit has started reconning the area. Sounds like I'll have to miss the inspection. Boss, we'll just have to send someone else to get them out. No. I'll go. Yeah. Chico and Paz would only take orders from you anyway. And we can't go taking on those Marines at the base head on. It's gotta be off the radar, and it's gotta be you. Skullface hints ironically he and Paz both know perfectly well what Big Boss will do because he's so dependable and brave. Skullface is carefully lining into place the idea through showing, not telling outright, that Big Boss's fate is sealed unless Paz will save him. Skullface is also making Paws feel like shit by twisting the knife, so to speak, about how great the man is that she's betrayed and supposedly doomed to die. Skullface yet again lures his subject subconsciously into exposure by conditioning a sense of trust, doing so apparently with privileged information. He lets slip that a nuclear inspection team's going to Mother Base, but this is just to nightmarishly torture Paws even further with the follow-up revelation, this inspection is only a ruse. This makes Paws feel for Snake even more, because the way Skullface frames it makes it sound as though, just like Paws, Snake is all alone against the world. Even his own organizations apparently betrayed him, including the quote, scientist. Likely Huey, but it could also refer to Strangelove. Skullface conveys the idea that his careful planning and immense agency have made him unstoppable, but that he's only gained this agency because of Paws' spy logs during Peace Walker. This subconsciously sets the stage for the real idea he wants to parasitize Paz's mind with, 
the idea that she can have back vicariously all the power and agency that she's lost through him. Note him poking her with his fingers upon the words, thanks to you. It all ends soon, exactly as I've planned. All thanks to you. Note how many different things that this phrase soon. suggests, exactly it all ends soon, yet how little it actually definitively says. All thanks to you. Cypher, who would never... Pause at around 128 manages to start to say, in effect, bullshit. Cypher would never kill Big Boss and end everything soon. Cypher, who would never... Yes. Cypher will surely mourn his death. I'll have no choice but to distance myself from the group. And then they'll eliminate you. No one will be left. Think about that. Now, Skullface's response seems to abruptly jump in the relevant sense of the word Cypher from the man Zero to the group. Skullface now rapidly unravels a series of veiled ideas, implying that Paz is only alive thanks to him, that he and he alone has the power to oppose Cypher, yet at the same time that Skullface has no say in the matter, that he is only an instrument of other people's wills, people like Paz. Then at 141, Skullface finishes his outline of the supposed coming chain of events with the inevitability of Paz's own death. And then they'll eliminate you. It's subtle, but Skullface implies Chico's either already dead or as good as dead when he says, No one will be left. This was why Skullface may have let pause hear Chico's electrocution. Don't. Don't do it. Don't. A punishment, by the way, still used in America by the state to kill criminals. Skullface paraphrases himself from the end of tape 5 when he said to Chico, I'll leave you to think it over. No one will be left. Think about that. Again, he lets his subject stew in their own juices and ultimately to torture, even effectively murder themselves. Then at 150 or so, Skullface pulls the rug out, as it were, giving Paws an ultimatum, giving her what appears to be, for the first time, freedom of choice. No one will be left. Think about that. Big Boss or Cypher. You can only save one. He says you can only save one. Big Boss or Cypher. It's a strange statement. Of course, she has every reason to choose Big Boss and not Cypher. However, in Skullface's formulation, this also de facto will mean choosing Skullface, who claims he's set to lose power if Big Boss dies. Cypher will surely mourn his death. I'll have no choice but to distance myself from the group. Skullface here effectively parasitizes the idea of Big Boss in Paz's skull. What happens next is a true testament to Paz's inner resolve. Despite being nearly beaten to death, she musters the strength and vivacity to laugh in Skullface's face. Big Boss or Cypher? You can only save one. <laughs> I will never talk. She says, I will never talk. But sadly, this is almost identical to what Chico said back in tape 5. I'll never help you! I will never talk. Both leave out the pain and guilt of what they can't face, of what they've already done. What they now say they'll never do, they've already done. They just refuse to identify with it, just like Skullface has taught them, by his refusal to identify himself with what he's doing and doing still to them. Again, exactly like with Chico, Skullface shows off his mastery of the art of the deal. He brushes off Paz's declaration and changes the conversation to something more hypothetical, even platonic. Subtly evoking Hamlet's to be or not to be, that is the question, Skullface says, the question is which of the two would you like to give a shot at survival? 
So now all of a sudden we're back to talking on Paz's terms, literally, about Cypher, i.e. zero, i.e. not the group. And now all of a sudden Skullface has introduced the idea that he has the power even to kill zero, as well as Big Boss. He's something like an all-powerful yet enslaved genie who serves, this is beginning to suggest, at Paz's sole command. I don't expect you to believe me. The question is, which of the two would you like to give a shot at survival? What I would like is to kill you. The feeling is mutual, but we are secret agents. Restraint is a virtue. Paz says at around 220, the thing she would really like is to kill Skullface. His response, the feeling is mutual, is deeply ironic. It could mean Skullface too would like to be killed, apart from the more obvious possible meaning that he would like to kill her. Next, Skullface, again, even more vociferously, implies he and Paz are united, ones of the same kind, so to speak. When he says, restraint is a virtue, he ironically is quoting the words of Mahatma Gandhi, quote, not to dine with a fellow being out of repugnance is a sin, not to dine with him by way of self-restraint is a virtue, end quote. Then, after reciting the famous philosopher and peace icon's words like a gramophone or record player, Skullface hits play on Here's to You. Presumably he has it queued up to the chorus, which starts to play immediately. We are secret agents. Restraint is a virtue. And curiously, what happens next is excerpted by the post credit sequence of Ground Zero's proper. And there, no song, mysteriously, can be heard. Your favorite song. Nicola Bart. Immigrants wrongly executed. But their death served as a message to others. That ours is a society that murders the innocent. Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? Your favorite song. Nicola Bart. Immigrants wrongly executed. But their death served as a message to others. That ours is a society that murders the innocent. Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? If so, the time is now. Cypher has been in hiding ever since his grand experiment. No one's seen him in years. All we hear are orders delivered by proxy. Except you. You met with him, face to face, in order to contact Big Boss. Tell me where he is. Where is Cypher? Where is Zero? I've never known choice. Where I was born, the language I speak, I've never had the freedom to choose for myself. But you, right now, are free. Do as you will. This will save Big Boss. It may. Will you really kill Zero for me? Not for you. A very strange yet precise detail, with lots of possible explanations, none of which are particularly satisfying, especially given Paz is in the end refrain of this moment too. Will you really kill Zero for me? Skullface uses music to trigger a reaction in Paz not too differently from what he'll do to the parasites years later in the Devil's House. It resembles here a moving moment from a motion picture 
a touching monologue set to a tune that captures the same emotional frequency, so to speak. It's all so very bizarre coming from Skullface, Paz's own torturer, but it seems to bolster his claim of powerlessness. It's as if this, right now, is Skullface speaking freely from the heart. And what do you know, he's speaking the words that Paz will feel as though she's already thinking, enslaving her to his self-serving notions of freedom and justice. It's sick psychological torture to suddenly confront a suffering, powerless wretch with the illusion of all powerfulness and all importance, of being a history maker, of being what American President George W. Bush might dub a decider. What's odd is that in the post credit sequence, the last word Skullface says before we cut off is, Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? But here, this is followed up by, Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? If so, the time is now. Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? Do you too believe your sacrifice will change the world? If so, the time is now. Cypher has been in hiding ever since. And then he only switches off the recording of Here's to You. Even though it sounds in the replay of this we get at the end of Ground Zeroes as if he switches off the tape recorder a few words earlier. Skullface also takes no steps that I can hear before doing so here, while at the end of Ground Zeroes he sounds as though he takes three. At 3.23 or so Skullface launches into the other bit of recording that plays over the final title card. Cypher has been in hiding ever since his grand experiment. No one's seen him in years. No one's seen him in years. All we hear are orders delivered by proxy. Except you. You met with except you. Face to face. You met with in order to contact face to Big face. Boss. In order to contact Big Boss. <laughs> he refers to a famous metonymy about America so commonly stated that no original speaker, no original source, can be rightly named. Using the phrase, Grand Experiment, it's implied that Skullface is referring ironically, sarcastically, to the Les Enfants project, but it could be a number of things. And whatever it is he's talking about, it's being characterized by a bitterly sarcastic Skullface as a kind of American revolution. Assuming the Grand Experiment is the cloning of Big Boss, which took place in 1972, that would mean the much later tape that we get at the end of the Phantom Pain of Zero and Pause was recorded shortly before Peace Walker. An obvious point, but one worth mentioning for the timeline. Okay, so now Skullface implies that Pause is super special for having met Zero face to face, that she's more special than anyone else in the organization, maybe more important than anyone in the world. Now Skullface reveals what he's really been after all along, what this entire horrible series of events has all been about. Finding Zero. Skullface can only trust the answer he obtains as a nod to both MGS2 and MGS4's plots if that answer is provided with authorization of Paz's own free will. The password entry itself cannot be performed unless brainwave patterns and heartbeats fall within normal parameters, rendering chemical and other forms of coercion impractical. In other words, the login must be made of the president's own free will. The keys to the system are Big Boss's genetic code and biometric data. Without them, there's no way to gain access. But Skullface asks while knowing not to expect an answer right away. He has one more little speech to give to really make Paz's manipulation complete. Skullface makes himself sound not so powerful, almost miserable and pitiable, pathetic in fact. All to contrast with Paz, who, right now, has a chance to take from Skullface what he claims he'll never have. The freedom to choose, not how she wants to live her life, but why she will end it. The freedom to choose to not only die, but die for something. To die, and this is huge now, for peace. 
Bullface then paraphrases the English ceremonial magician Alistair Crowley and his belief system of Thelema, do what thou wilt. Paz asks if Skullface will really kill Zero for her, to which Skullface retorts darkly, not for you. It's not about actions here, it's about thoughts. She isn't being told she's free to have Zero killed, but that she's free to decide he's the one who ought to, in theory, not be guaranteed a shot at survival. Skullface saves the meaning of the revenge against Zero for himself and himself alone. And with Paz's answer, abbreviated by more static and, and interference, tape six comes to an end. Not for you. All right. Zero is... Hell's Kitchen. 10th Avenue. Yes. Undergoing treatment there. In the little fragment of tape six that we finally receive at the end of the Phantom Pain, we hear Skullface seem to paraphrase a comment by someone from the NSA in the wake of 9-11. The ramp up of domestic surveillance by the NSA is actually something with surprising saliency for MGSV. Here's the quote in question. In response to the September 11th attacks, a system that was innovated by John Poindexter, a former Reagan official, called the Information Awareness Office, came into being. According to James Bamford in The Shadow Factory, quote, Ted Senator, one of John Poindexter's colleagues, used a metaphor to describe the difficult task ahead in creating the program called Total Information Awareness. Senator said, quote, Our task is akin to finding dangerous groups of needles hidden in stacks of needle pieces. This is much harder than simply finding needles in a haystack. We have to search through many stacks, not just one. We do not have a contrast between shiny hard needles and dull, fragile hay. We have many ways of putting the pieces together into individual needles and the needles into groups of needles, and we cannot tell if a needle or group is dangerous until it is at least partially assembled. Though in principle at least, we must track all the needle pieces all of the time and consider all possible combinations. The process that fans would go through by playing MGSV of trying to put the pieces of this game together are very similar to the Herculean task that the NSA faced. A former NSA official would say later on in the book, quote, our ability to collect stuff far outstrips our ability to understand what we collect. This is the central problem, the core problem. There's just an unbelievable amount of information. The military would never have a prayer of finding their way through it. Do they have the analysts to chomp on it? No way. I submit that because MGS5 was released at a time when video games could be easily recorded and the internet was connecting players instantaneously, the challenge was how to create a story filled with Easter eggs and secrets that wouldn't be immediately found out. I think that using the, the NSA and the Total Information Awareness Plan as the paradigm, MGSV arrived at an incredibly ambiguous storyline full of possible interpretations that not even an experienced intelligence analyst would probably be able to completely decipher. The other residents are of varying race and ages, but in reality, all 40 units are cipher personnel. It took him 10 years to replace the original occupants. He's got places like this all over the world. No better place to hide a needle than a stack of needles. And that, in part, is what makes it such a masterpiece, not only of espionage fiction, but the medium of video games. Skullface's true motives are spelled out in the agent's recording. This skull is who I am. My mark, my proof of humanity. I have no country, no language, I have no face, but I haven't lost my skull. So I told myself, the pain and effort that keep me alive will never know relief, never bear fruit, never be repaid. 
I know that. But I told myself to focus on some hope, a non-existent hope, to guide me through this burning world. A hope. Call it a dream. A melancholic delusion. As the pressures within me stretch me to bursting, and I force myself not to cry out, though the words I thought were carved into me are gone, and all I knew is dead. <gasps> I know how you feel. I've felt that. So show me that I'm not the only one. That you too can return to this world for revenge. His melancholic dream, as he calls it, is to not be alone in his pain and loss. By filling the entire world with a similar kind of phantom pain, Goldface will regain the family, the family he's lost through shared kinship bonds, defined by grief. As he says, he has to accomplish something to fulfill the wills of all those that he lost in World War II, which is something of a nod to the boss and her legacy. In that tape, if you notice, Skullface ironically paraphrases the, one of the most famous quotes in the 20th century by any American activist, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. What Skullface wants most, what he dreams of, is to build a world where small language groups are free from oppression, and a balance of power can exist with equality, without any one dominant ruler taking control. At the time of 1975, the only two viable candidates who might become such a dominant force Skullface has to worry about once the Cold War ends are MSF and Cypher. First big boss, then zero. Liberation is at hand. Skullface seems to be capitalizing on Cypher's decision to gradually replace Zero with the Patriot AIs. The idea to have an AI act for Zero came about in 74, when the data from the mammal pod penetrated NORAD. Clearly an AI couldn't be allowed to make its own decisions. So they would take away its ability to act, and instead create a specialized system in which the AI, bound by specific rules, filters the massive amounts of data it collects before passing it on to people, subtly guiding their decision making. If both Big Boss and Zero can be taken out of the picture while they're both too focused on each other, both of their respective systems, private militias and states, will be possible to steer from the outside by Skullface, to create the utopia, or rather dystopian, future that he envisions. Nukes. Controlled by a man, not a country. If they proliferate, conventional nukes lose all value. Political, military, and economic. The two superpowers become powerless. When the 40th Army crossed the Amu River four years ago, detente went right out the window. The U.S. Congress chose not to ratify SALT II, and Reagan's hardline politics won in the presidency in a landslide. According to him, the Soviet Union's an evil empire. <laughs> the Second Cold War. And there's been no end to regional conflicts and civil wars. Lebanon, the Falklands, Grenada, Iran, Iraq, the story never changes. But countries have yet to develop an effective means of dealing with terrorism. Afraid of losing their own men, they've pulled their forces out, handing private forces a golden opportunity. Private forces? Small armies with no national affiliation, working for the highest bidder. That's right, they got the idea from you. After Mother Base went down, they began spreading to meet the soaring demand. Skullface will take out MSF so that nuclear brinkmanship can return and PMCs, along with word of MSF's nuclear weapon, can spread far and wide. I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after, word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. 
What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. The destruction of MSF will have a direct impact on the political situation in parts of Africa, for just one example, where borderline race-based warfare is already going on. Fullface will also neutralize Zero, luring him into dropping his guard, poisoning him with a mysterious pathogen, and then forcing him to hand over control to the AIs. Fullface's endgame seems to be constructing a private system, whereby proxy warfare and nuclear proliferation on the black market halt the continued spread of imperialism. By taking something from everyone and evening the global scales, superpowers like the US, let alone the Soviet Union, will become no more or less powerful than any other state. As Skullface says, everyone will be united in equality. Why will this happen? Because these superpowers like the US will be forced in the new world order that Skullface has in mind to engage in mostly regional conflicts and police actions which will only breed more of the same by stirring up more and more lusts for revenge. Sans lingua franca, the world will be torn asunder, and then it shall be free. People will suffer, of course, a phantom pain. The world will need a new common tongue, a language of nukes. My metal ears shall be the thread by which all countries are bound together in equality. No words will be needed. Every man will be forced to recognize his neighbor. People will swallow their pain. They will link lost hands. And the world will become one. This war is peace. This is something where explained outright has already occurred by the events of MGS4. But all of what I've just said is conjecture. What's much more concrete is how Skullface goes about bringing his plans, whatever they may be, to fruition. By capturing Paws and instigating a fake IAEA inspection, Skullface paralyzes MSF. They can't do anything lest they risk being detected. This ensures that MSF will have to move Eastern Bloc personnel off base, personnel like Chico being as he's part of the Sandinistas. The most logical place for MSF to send Chico is with his sister in Havana, yet MSF can't stop the spread of the news that Paz survived. Given Chico's background as a formidable mountain climber, all these factors come together to make the prospect for Chico of rescuing Paz irresistible. All he has to do is slip off that boat which of course he does. By turning Chico and Paz, once they're on the base together, first towards, then against each other, Skullface kills a staggering number of birds with just one stone. He uses Chico to force Snake off base with his distress call right as the inspections are slated to go down. Meanwhile, Skullface uses Paz to obtain the only intel that he could never get otherwise, Zero's location. Now, I think Skullface may have engineered for Big Boss to survive, actually, at the end of Ground Zeroes. Here's why. The only reason everyone in that chopper doesn't die is because something miraculously causes Paws, right after they've all narrowly escaped the raid on MSF, to awaken with all her faculties intact. Notice that unlike every single other detainee as far as we can see in Ground Zeroes, Paws' feet aren't mutilated. They've merely been handcuffed together. This, along with all the guilt that Skullface drills into Paws that we've been discussing throughout this episode, works to ensure that Paws, when the time comes to jump, will have the trifecta, motive, means, and opportunity. This gives what the XOF medic says to Skullface in the next tape a double meaning. Prep the package. She's all closed up. Timer set for your instructions. We can't have her waking up or dying on us. I gave her a transfusion, a nutrient cocktail, and an anesthetic. How long does she have? 24 hours, same as her cargo. She won't last much longer than that. 
Basically, a lot of this comes down to something that we'll discuss more in the next episode, a key innovation brought about by the Cold War, and World War II for that matter, the field known as game theory. For now, I'll just say game theory is about, at bottom, trying to predict the behavior of rational players in advance, something that we see Skullface do time and time again. The only question that's left for now is why would Skullface keep Big Boss, who I've just admitted is a threat to his New World Order, alive? Well, again, this is conjecture, but I believe it's because Skullface is following the paradigm of Inksos from 1984. And the big difference between Inksosh and the tyrants that lived and died before them is something explained in the following passage, which I'll end with now. The first thing for you to understand is that in this place there are no martyrdoms. You have read of the religious persecutions of the past. In the Middle Ages there was the Inquisition. It was a failure. It set out to eradicate heresy and ended by perpetuating it. For every heretic it burned at the stake, thousands of others rose up. Why was that? Because the Inquisition killed its enemies in the open and killed them while they were still unrepentant. In fact, it killed them because they were unrepentant. Men were dying because they would not abandon their true beliefs. Naturally, all the glory belonged to the victim, and all the shame to the Inquisitor who burned him. Later, in the 20th century, there were the totalitarians, as they were called. There were the German Nazis and the Russian Communists. The Russians persecuted heresy more cruelly than the Inquisition had done, and they imagined that they had learned from the mistakes of the past. They knew, at any rate, that one must not make martyrs. Before they exposed their victims to public trial, they deliberately set themselves to destroy their dignity. They wore them down by torture and solitude until they were despicable, cringing wretches, confessing whatever was put into their mouths, covering themselves with abuse, accusing and sheltering behind one another, whimpering for mercy. And yet, after only a few years, the same thing had happened over again. The dead men had become martyrs, and their degradation was forgotten. Once again, why was it? In the first place, because the confessions that they had made were obviously extorted and untrue. We do not make mistakes of that kind. All the confessions that are uttered here are true. We make them true. And above all, we do not allow the dead to rise up against us. You must stop imagining that posterity will vindicate you, Winston. Posterity will never hear of you. You will be lifted clean out from the stream of history. We shall turn you into gas and pour you into the stratosphere. Nothing will remain of you, not a name in a register, not a memory in a living brain. You will be annihilated in the past as well as in the future. You will never have existed. O'Brien smiled slightly. You are a flaw in the pattern. Winston. You are a stain that must be wiped out. Did I not tell you just now that we are different from the persecutors of the past? We are not content with negative obedience, nor even with the most abject submission. When finally you surrender to us, it must be of your own free will. We do not destroy the heretic because he resists us. So long as he resists us, we never destroy him. We convert him. We capture his inner mind. We reshape him. We burn all evil and all illusion out of him. We bring him over to our side, not in appearance, but genuinely, heart and soul. We make him one of ourselves before we kill him. It is intolerable to us that an erroneous thought should exist anywhere in the world, however secret and powerless it may be. Even in the instant of death we cannot permit any deviation. In the old days the heretic walked to the stake, still a heretic, proclaiming his heresy, exulting in it. Even the victim of the Russian purges could carry rebellion locked up in his skull as he walked down the passage waiting for the bullet. But we make the brain perfect before we blow it out. The command of the old despotisms was, Thou shalt not. The command of the totalitarians was, Thou shalt. Our command is thou art 